This episode of The Unstarving Musician is sponsored by Liner Notes. Learn from the hundreds of musicians and industry pros I've spoken with for The Unstarving Musician on topics such as marketing, songwriting, touring, sync licensing, and much more. Sign up for Liner Notes. Liner Notes is an email newsletter from yours truly in which I share some of the best knowledge gems garnered from the many conversations featured on The Unstarving Musician. You'll also be privy to the latest podcast episodes and Liner Notes subscriber exclusives. Sign up at unstarvingmusician.com. It's free and you can unsubscribe at any time. This is The Unstarving Musician. I'm Robonzo. This is my podcast. It features conversations with independent music artists and industry professionals with occasional special topic episodes featuring yours truly, a glimpse into the minds of my varied guests, all intended to help independent music artists better understand the marketing, business, and creative processes that empower us to do more of what we love, make music. Welcome to another episode, and thank you, thank you, thank you for joining me. It is always a pleasure to be in your earbuds or on your speakers, your Sonos your car stereo, whatever. Do we still call it a car stereo? I don't even know. Is it an audio system? Could be. Times have changed. I am having a great week. Did a fun presentation for the Music Marketing Method clan. The prezzo was about how to promote your music and get new fans with podcasts, specifically by being a guest on podcasts. Let me know if you're interested in that topic. I'd love to arrange another presentation for you and yours your crew, your people, or you and some other people. I'm always talking about needing support to keep this show going. Well, I just updated our crowd sponsor page with a tip jar button. You can just click, leave a tip, done. <laughs> if you'd like to check that out, please go to unstarvingmusician.com forward slash crowd sponsor. Your support equals love. So I wanted to, you know, catch up on the latest news for this Ramble preamble, and I see that uh, Miley Cyrus has announced a new single for her loyalist fans. Selena Gomez has a new single coming soon, uh, and YouTube launches samples—a quick way to discover new music. We'll see. I'll check that out. Maybe it's good. I don't know. But other than that, I know JJ Lovegrove had a listening party on Bandcamp that I RSVP'd for, and I missed. JJ, I'm sorry. I'm bummed. Hopefully there's a replay or something. But anyway, I got to talk to you and I've I got a sneak peek, a sneak preview of the album, which was awesome. You guys can check her new music out at jjlovegrove.bandcamp.com. She'll be on an upcoming episode soon. Let's get to my guest. I won't keep you waiting any longer. Worth Weaver is my guest. What a great name, Worth Weaver. He's a guitarist for the Wilmington, North Carolina-based rock band All the Pretty Things, and that's spelt as one word, All the Pretty Things, all in lowercase. It looks crazy. Worth is also a producer and an experienced touring guitarist working with the bands He Is Legend and Thousand Foot Crutch. He loves music, this guy, and he loves music production. He, in fact, lives and breathes music. When he's not producing, recording, and playing, he works with all the sound gear related stuff at a music company called Mojo Tone with one of his bandmates. All the Pretty Things, his band, had recently released a single called I Want You Back when we spoke, when we recorded this conversation, and they have an album coming soon. We talk about working remotely as a band, of course the new single in the album as well, embracing the emo genrefication that All the Pretty Things have gotten, how the band formed, music influences, learning the studio and all the changes in recording technology. This is a good conversation for anyone aspiring to get into production or engineering. We talk about the heaviness of his band, the heavy undertones. We also talk about Trent Reznor, Rick Rubin, and Glenn Johns, and working hard on socials and being okay with that, on social media, that is. And a little bit about his day gig with Mojo Tone, and more, always more, right? Learn even more about Worth and his band All the Pretty Things at allthepretythingsofficial.com. Here is me talking to Worth Weaver of All the Pretty Things. Hey, how are you? Good, man. I've uh, actually uh, I've had an off day as far as like didn't uh, didn't go into the day gig. 
and just been doing stuff around my house and in the studio, prepping some files to send to a mix engineer in Nashville today. So, Oh, cool. Where are you based? Uh, right in Wilmington, North Carolina. Okay. I thought I read something about North Carolina. And I think, is that where the whole band is, I, I, think, I guess? We're actually kind of scattered everywhere, man. We, uh, Tristan is in Houston. Okay. Jeremy lives in Durham, North Carolina. And Will, our bass player that we just added to the lineup, he lives in Kentucky. So how does that work for you guys when you're recording and I assume rehearsing occasionally? Or are you guys doing everything remotely these days? You know, we, we basically started the project when we were, or when COVID was going on. And so uh, I just ended up writing a bunch of songs. Tristan and I developed and, and worked through you know, several different demos. And then we just started kind of, you know, shopping around and asking our friends. Basically what we do now, man, is, you know, we we write remotely and we just kind of work that way just because that's how we started and it's comfortable. I mean, we're looking forward to to getting in the band room and really hashing out the ideas, you know, real time. I think that's going to add a lot of energy. Uh, but, you know, we've been doing it pretty much uh, mostly remote. You know, people will come to the studio here in Wilmington, like Jeremy would come in to, to track drums um you know for instance but but yeah man we're really trying to to stick to remote right now just because it's so easy and effective sure well it's funny i mean the the only recordings i've ever done a couple of songs were you know people were in three different states actually i was out not even in the same country but um, two of the guys were in different states and and uh but when i listen to your recordings it never crosses my mind of course i guess a lot of people are doing that now i, I talked to a I talked to an artist the other day and they were mentioning the whole remote thing. And it sat when I was listening to them, I was thinking it's kind of weird for him to reflect on them not being in the same place when they were recording, but uh, it seems more and more common. Yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, it's kind of a, it's kind of the way, you know, <laughs> at least it's the, the new way, I guess you could say. Yeah. Yeah. Do you work directly with Jamie at, at for the win media? I don't work for Jamie. She's actually our manager and publicist. I meant with her. I didn't mean. I didn't mean. I don't know. Oh if I yeah, said yeah, for yeah. Her. <laughs> That's cool. So she manages you guys too. Yeah, she does. Well, that's she cool. does killer, killer job, man. She's fantastic. I didn't know she did. I mean, I, I always thought that she and they were just PR, and so I didn't know she did management for you. I think she contacted me. By was that her that I was speaking with, or that was speaking with between the two of us? moments ago yes that was jamie <laughs> that's the first time i've talked to her and she she sent me a lot of um prospective guests she's been really nice to work with but uh yeah i'll have to have to talk to her sometime a little bit more and learn more about what she does but i'm glad to hear it's been a good experience yeah man so uh what about you what uh, what do you do i'm living la vida loca in mexico with my wife we moved here in um April of last year, and before that, we were in Panama for about six years, I think. Yeah, about six years. Nice. And so, yeah, I, I do the podcast. I play some music, occasionally do some web design work. And, Beautiful. Uh, yeah, just trying to live the more tranquil life out here. <laughs> I completely understand, man. Completely understand. That's uh, that's the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So your guys' latest single, I hope I'm caught up, is I Want You Back, right? Yes, it is. And uh, we have had a great response so far. We're really pumped. And uh, it's definitely uh, taking our band as far as recognition to, you know, the next level, which, you know, we're all really stoked about. You know, we produced that here and it just uh, turned out exactly, exactly how we uh, we wanted it. And, you know, Bo Virchel mixed it, uh, who is the guitar player from Sayosin, but he's also a badass mix engineer. Uh, and he's mixing our full length as well. Is he the guy in Nashville? No, the guy in Nashville I was referring to is a guy named Mark Frigo. Frigo. Uh, he's done a lot more like Americana country stuff, but uh, I mean, his uh, his list of, of credits is, is pretty substantial, man. He's uh, I think he's, he's he's got a Grammy nomination on his uh, on his mix creds. So he's uh, he's cool. But uh, Bo is located out in California. Oh, how do you guys know him? Bo and uh, Tristan are a uh, guitarist. He, uh, I think Tristan and Bo were touring together and Tristan was tech either teching for his band or they were just on the same tour. And I think they established a, a really close friendship. And so when we got the demos rolling, 
maybe at this point in time, about two, two and a half years ago, maybe a little longer, we were just talking about mix engineers and Tristan brought up Bo's name and, you know, we started a conversation, sent him like a test song to mix and we were all just floored, just blown away. And we were like, okay, this is the guy. And now he's a part of the team. Yeah, and Mike Kalasian is our mastering engineer. He's uh, he's also done just you know the who's who in the industry, and uh, you know we've got a really solid group of of people on the team that that are all just driving towards the same vision, which is really cool. Have you guys released anything other than "I Want You Now" and "Every Now and Then"? Uh, we've released the, the latest single "I Want You Back." We've done uh, "Every Now and Then," and then our first single was called "Teenage Lines," which is uh, That's what you I know, thought. Okay. Yeah, that was kind of the the breakout welcome to our band kind of single and uh you know everything is uh is hitting the way that we want it to man like i I've, I've never been as you know I've, I've been a producer engineer for about i guess 18 years at this point in time and have been playing guitar for well over you know two and a half decades and this is uh the best stuff that i've put out as a producer engineer and as a songwriter performer so uh, you know it's it's really sick man i'm i'm about as pumped as i've ever been on on music right now nice okay so and i apologize if i said the name of the the that new release incorrectly but okay so i'm just trying to get up speed with everything you guys have done i see four singles is that right or have you done more than that we've done three singles so far ah okay yep I think I'm looking at one of them twice. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, so I was listening to them. They sound fantastic. So congrats. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> congrats. Yeah. Yeah. I really like them. Uh, and stylistically, I was watching, I don't know if I was watching a reel with, I think your singer and he was describing uh, one of the songs kind of a uh, weighty emotionally, you know, and, and you guys mm -hmm. for whether it's, for real or you're just sort of riding it you seem to embrace the whole emo tag that you got and i kind of just wanted to ask is that really a thing for all of you guys that you are super inspired by that genre or is it just kind of the sound that comes out of the band oh yeah man we all grew up in in the yeah you know, i guess you could say emo rock scene uh when we were younger and you know a lot of us played in bands that were uh very very actively involved in that scene and i think it's very sentimental to us but uh, we wanted to to create music that made us feel the way that we felt back then. And I feel like uh, we've really accomplished that. And we're all having a blast writing it, recording it. And, you know, we're, we're just stoked to get it out in front of uh, in front of a massive group of people and play it in front of them. That's cool. So and there is a full length album kind of in the work or that you have in mind. The record is actually done. And uh, we just got first mixes back. Nice. So we're just, you know, finalizing and tweaking a few things here and there. And then it's off to Mike to master. And uh, then the uh, the full length will be done. It'll have 10 tracks total, including the three singles that we've already released. Very nice. What's the projected release date? We are not sure. Uh, looking like sometime toward the end of the year. We, you know, we're just trying to, to figure out our strategy a little bit more. And, you know, they're are some uh, interested parties we're talking to trying to see how that's going to develop but it, it's a little too soon to tell when it when it comes to an actual release date but yeah definitely you know towards the end of the year early next year for for sure and we'll probably release another single uh during that window of time cool well it sounds amazing um the stuff i've heard and you know i just in all honesty it sounds a little bigger a little better than most of the stuff i've heard lately when i listen to like you know, other artists that I've had on the podcast as of late. It's, it's great. Really great stuff. Thank you, man. I, uh, I work my ass off to try to deliver a product that doesn't just sound good sonically, but also, you know, has, has the vibe we want and, and just stripes that emotional, you know, elicits that emotional response from the listener. That's what I'm always more focused on, you know, rather than like the snare sound or the guitar tone, I'm, I'm really more focused on how all those elements work together and, you know, create the vibe for the track to, to hit the listener with that emotion we're going for, you know? Yeah. And it seems like when I listen to it, the, you guys are all just really good players and a bit unique, I suppose, because again, you're, I mean, I know you can do so much in the studio and all, but it just sounds like everybody, 
everybody's firing on all cylinders, I guess, for lack of lack of better words. And it sounds okay. So three of you have been together a while, and then you have an, a newish bass player. Is that right? Yeah, Will Sowers uh, just joined the band. He uh, was a founding member of Emerosa and also was the touring bassist for Civil Twilight. Both, you know, big bands that have have done plenty of tours. Uh, he's a a killer bass player and you know we're really excited moving forward especially for the next round of songs uh you know hearing his contribution because you know he comes from the same scene that we do and and he feels the same way about delivering that that product that has the 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 biggest impact on the listener you know and we really uh i almost said it but i'll go ahead and say it at our age (laughs) We uh, we've we've shed a lot of that ego that, you know, you would typically hear about with younger bands or I mean, I'm I'm fairly certain that I have my fair fair share of ego when I was younger, too. But I think we uh, we're we're approaching this from a, a more ego less perspective and we're really fearless about throwing out ideas. You know, we don't feel like we're boxed in and we're not really trying to appease a specific group or alienate a specific group of listener. We're just making the music we've always wanted to make and it's fun. And I think that we all, you know, once you get wrapped up in the, in the business side of things, uh, sometimes the fun can, can get cast to the side, but that's kind of our, our vision is, you know, we want to create that emotionally heavy, impactful music, but still make it fun, still have a great time. And we just want to have a a big party with the people that want to listen with us. (laughs) Nice. And how did you guys hook up with Will? Yeah, we knew Will just, you know, through years of touring with different bands and coming across each other. And, you know, you always make the best of friends when you're on tour. You know, it kind of turns into more of a family situation. So, you know, we've toured and this I'm speaking for everyone in the band. We've all toured for for quite, you know, a number of years throughout our careers. And, you know, you come into contact with a lot of cool people and some of those relationships you, you sustain. And then you know, that was someone that we just kept in touch with. And whenever it was the time for, Hey, we need a bass player. Uh, we, you know, we made a list and he was on the short list and he was very interested. And so we decided to move forward. We will. How long has all the pretty things been a band? We, Tristan and I are the guitar player. We started writing demos. Wow. Maybe five years ago. Okay. Um, I was actually, I had a partnership with, another studio in town and Tristan rolled through the studio one day and we just kind of struck up a conversation and, you know, we figured out that we had had some mutual friends in the industry through, you know, touring and we dug the same music and we just kind of kicked around uh, over many, many beers, the idea of forming a band. And we just kind of started to, to write demos and we would just, Tristan and I would send them back and forth. And whenever we, you know, I think maybe had five solid demos that we were like, Hey, this musically is doing something cool. Then we went on the, uh, the search for our vocalist or for a vocalist. And, uh, we've had, we had several different guys, uh, and I think a girl audition and, uh, Logan sent, sent us uh, a completely produced fleshed out demo. And we were like, that's the guy, that's the sound. What do we have to do to get you in this band, Logan? (laughs) Nice. And I've known Logan for many years. Uh, he uh, he's also a Wilmington native, and so we grew up in the same town. knew all you know all the same guys, all the same friends. Played in, in different bands. Uh, he and I were never in the same band previously, but you know we knew each other and and thought of each other in you know high regard. So uh, it was that was a pretty seamless integration when it comes to to Logan jumping into the picture. Cool. That's always yeah. nice. Is Tristan the one that is is he from South Africa? Yes, Originally. Tristan. Yeah, Tristan is from South Africa. It's funny. I, I was thinking every time I uh, hear someone from South Africa talk the first time, I'm like have trouble figuring out where they're from. <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of a, a I don't want to say a weird accent, but it's tough to place, like you said, you know. And yeah, it, initially I was like, are are you like kind of Australian? <laughs> and you know, he, of course, you know, I'm sure there was an eye roll that came off of that, but. But yeah, man, Tristan, we were doing an interview. This was, I mean, this was last year whenever Teenage Lions came out. Everyone in the band was all on the uh, on the Zoom call. And I can't remember who the interview was with, but it was with a couple dudes who had a, a pretty large music podcast. And they were 
And Tristan opened his mouth for the first time and they were like, oh, dude, cool accent. And Tristan stops immediately and goes, uh, actually, all of you guys, or I'll say like, actually, all of you guys have accents. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was it was hilarious, man. We uh, we embrace it and have a great time. <laughs> I uh, I grew up in the South, so I have a slight Southern draw uh, every once in a while, but it'll rear its ugly head. I also toured with a band in Canada for the better part of a couple of years, and so I've got a few Canadianisms that'll slip out every once in a while. Just this weird hodgepodge of vernacular. <laughs> yeah, it's funny you say that. I have the same thing. So I, I grew up in Texas, and then... Uh, oddly, when we moved to Panama, I encountered a lot of Canadians, and you know, some of them become friends and and um, close friends, and you start picking up. I'm one of those people. I tend, I feel like kind of a parrot, so I'll pick up some of the things that they say, which is probably odd from someone who's originally from Texas when someone figures that bit out. But exactly. <laughs> How do you? I, um, I don't always talk about this, but for whatever reason, I find it a little fascinating. The genrefication of bands by maybe by the media but how do you like one thing i read is it's a blend of post-hardcore emo and alternative rock how does that sit with you you know man i'm I'm fine with it like everybody's got to say what they somewhat sound like you know i'm not gonna try to classify us in a genre i don't think we belong or that we don't resonate with or sound like but i as far as the labeling itself man it doesn't really bother me i mean it's it's just uh it's a quick way to, to identify like what vibe you are as a band. Uh, but it never, like if someone were to call us a screamo band, I would be like, well, we're not exactly screamo. If someone were to call us a death metal band, obviously that's not correct. But, you know, labeling us as emo alt rock band, totally fine with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There, there are worse things, I guess, given um, the sound that you have, if people mistook you for, there are many things they could maybe mistake you or, or say about you, but yeah, I don't know why. I'm always a little curious about that. Some people re- kind of reject those. And, um, you know, when I when I had released the, my first two songs, I, I let people tell me who I sounded like. Just or I, You know, I, I tried to remember that because I was always a little surprised, sometimes pleasantly and sometimes, wow, I, I, that's, that's interesting. That's cool. But I, I tend to talk about my influences, and I think maybe it's sort of, at least in my head, it would help people know, oh, okay, so he's into these things, so at least some facet of what he's doing sounds like, like those guys. But I don't guess that's always the case. What what kind of music are you personally into? Uh, yeah, what are your influences? Well, man, I grew up listening to a ton of classic rock. Like, that was my dad's choice. And I mean, like, Beatles, Zeppelin, you can go down the list. The Eagles were really big, Doobie Brothers. So just a lot of that. So a lot of my like musical IQ came from like the classic rock uh, genre. And then whenever I was in high school, I started studying jazz and I continued that through college. So I did, you know, I got really into blues and jazz on guitar. And then after college, I, I joined some heavier rock bands and got really into heavy rock. But I think as far as a guitarist, I would say probably classic rock or, you know, some sort of like progressive heavy rock would be, you know, my two major influences. And then as a songwriter, classic rock oldies, like those, those guys can just write killer songs, you know, it was kind of before production was anywhere near what it's at now, as far as like quality, but the the songs spoke for themselves. And, you know, the artists were absolutely killer. You you had to be amazing to record, you know, in a studio back then. (laughs) So yeah, and I actually love some of the really old production. I, I marvel at it because I know, like, wow, we practically have everything they have had in some of those early rock albums that we have in our home studios now. And, oh, yeah. And yet they produce these crazy, insane uh, recordings. Yeah, and uh, I mean, that's, I, I think as far as, like, producing and engineering tones, man, that's definitely, like, one of my favorite things to do because you know there's an infinite amount of variables and all of them are tweakable and it's just you know you can have the most fun yeah so you sound like you've done a lot of or spent at least a good amount of your time in music in the studio and i mean sort of hands-on is that right absolutely absolutely i started recording man it was probably like 2004 2005 somewhere in there 
Uh, and I, you know, I started right when digital technology was becoming somewhat accessible. So I did a, a big tour, came off the road and, and had a good payout. And I ended up buying my first Pro Tools rig uh, and like a Mac G4. And, you know, I think it was like a Digi O2 Mac G4. And I had like this light pipe, like Digimax extender. And, you know, I bought a ton of mics, monitors, and just started recording local bands for next to nothing because I was just fascinated with recording. And then local bands, you know, they had a good experience, told their friends, people started coming to me and I was like, hmm, maybe I should do this. And I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed not just the technical aspects, but also the relationships that I established when creating in the studio with someone else. I think that's like an invaluable piece of the puzzle. And that's what helped build uh, my reputation personally was just, you know, being a good hang and, and always letting the band know, like we are working towards a vision together and I want to help you guys get there. And so like trying to, to constantly push the band and also push myself in the process, you know, because the learning curve, uh, back in 2004, five, six, there was no YouTube, you know, no, no cell phones really, uh, at least to the modern day capacity. So, I mean, it was, it was trial by fire. And once I figured out, I wanted to do it, I was like, okay, I'm going to try to get some internships and, you know, ask uh, larger producers if they would be willing to share any information with me. So I wish I would have had the access to, you know, the amount of, of knowledge that's out there today back then it certainly would have sped up my uh, my journey but you know what man it's it's been incredibly rewarding and expensive <laughs> <laughs> but you know you have this great benefit advantage of things that you probably don't think much about maybe just from time to time but that you bring from the earlier days of your recording when things were so much different that sometimes apply or creep their way into ideas that you have today i would imagine of course, man, you know, like today I can, you know, jump down in the studio and in an afternoon have like a fully fl like fl fleshed out demo. Like uh, hypothetically, I would just write a demo for my band. I can have, you know, great sounding drums programmed. I can play the bass and the guitars with, you know, digital modeling amps and have a, a solid song piece of music that, hey, guys, this is my vision. And I can have it done in an afternoon, whereas, you know, before I would have to like mic up a drum kit because, you know, that and that process in and of itself is, is a huge undertaking. So like the advent of technology or like modern day recording technology has just enhanced my creative workflow way more than I ever thought possible. But you're right, like the limitations that I had to get through back then and all like the the, you know, the weird shortcuts and compromises that I had to make because of you know, limited system or a limited setup, I think have ultimately kind of shaped the way I view things now. And I don't rely on the technology. It's just like an added bonus at this point in time. Yeah. I, I was thinking about, so I, I had a life in IT some years ago and I remember when I'm moving from Texas to Silicon Valley and uh, getting, joining a, an IT team there. And I, um, I don't think any of my peers, I was doing like a desktop support thing and none of them had, uh, had, um, any reasonable amount of experience with a prompt working on a prompt at a prompt, you know, like with a DOS prompt and, you know, obviously you know, windows and windows server and all those things and, and networking are, are a big thing by, by this time, this is like in, I think 99, 2000. And, uh, I just told one of them, he's like, man, you, you need to, you need to learn uh, how to work at the prompt. It'll help you troubleshoot so much more, but I have to think anyway, it's sort of this difference of growing, um, similarity and growing up, in technology just a little bit earlier than than a lot of other people and just the, the weird advantages it can give you and like you said you don't even have to rely on a lot of it because you have these practic almost like analog <laughs> sort of tricks that you that you learned along the way oh yeah man Ab absolutely you just pick up these uh, i kind of tell people who ask me like hey man how did you get in production like how do you how do you know all these things and i was like man i just basically made so many mistakes early on and every time i made a mistake it was just like this mental catalog this mental library of well don't do that again don't do that again you know like so whenever i encounter a problem or situation be it in tracking editing mixing i can just like go back in my brain and be like how do i solve this problem what did work before what didn't work before you know and just kind of move through that way and now i've just got this 
brain full of, you know, situations that I've dealt with by doing, I've, I've probably done 250 bands. I have no idea more, more than that, less than that. <laughs> a ton amazing. of artists, like solo artists. It really comes down to like the interaction you have with a performer because it's easy for, you know, especially if you're really green coming into the studio and you never recorded before, it's easy to kind of get easily frustrated. And so it's kind of my job to elicit this, you know, the performance that I consider to be like standard, you know, industry standard, like what I know I want the project to sound like as far as a, a polished level. And it's my job to communicate properly to the performer and get them comfortable and you know, if they're having a tough time, suggest a few uh, different approaches, you know, a great, great examples on guitars, like guitars are the, one of the toughest things to track, uh, at, at least for, for most people, because it's such a finicky instrument when it comes to tuning, when it comes to noise, if you're using gain, I mean, there's, there's a ton of expressiveness that's there, but there's also so many variables, like I said. And so whenever I'm working with a guitarist that, that can't quite nail a part, you know, I'll break it up and be like, okay, man, let's just do the first half of the riff, get it super clean. And then we'll, you know, I'll punch you on the second, you know, like pretty, pretty common stuff, but, but it's all about communicating and keeping the performer comfortable, comfortable in the situation, because if they're not excited about it, that's going to translate to the, you know, the recording, even if it's perfectly played in time in tune, if the energy is not there it's not going to resonate with the listener. So I, I really try to keep the energy and the drive and the push up in the studio. I want everybody, everyone to stay excited. I want everyone to stay motivated. Uh, so whenever I feel that kind of dip starting to happen, uh, I have to kind of shift gears and, and almost turn into like a mini psychologist in the studio and, and like, okay, guys, let's, let's take a step back. You know, let's, let's listen, let's look, let's, let's figure out what we want to do. What's not working. What is working. Do you, do you, tend to try to help musicians out also if they're feeling a little stressed or a little anxiety about being in the studio and having somebody who's spending their time, you know, like you to help them craft the sound they want? Oh yeah, man. I mean, it's, it's just a part of the, the process, you know, everyone responds differently to criticism, you know, and some people take it very personally and shut down, you know? So if I would, uh, you know, hypothetical track and a guitar player and he's in love with this part. And I'm like, Hey man, uh, that should be an A, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, not, not the chord that you are playing or trying to play, you know? So I'll, but I can communicate that criticism, uh, in different ways. Some people respond to being, you know, kind of like having that fire lit under them in, in a more aggressive way. Uh, and then, like I said, some people shut down. So it's just about figuring out how the performer is going to respond, you know, to, to ideas or criticism and then, you know, just feed off of that energy and move forward. Yeah, that's cool. You mentioned as we started talking about recording that you found some folks that would, or asked folks if they would let you intern with them. Were, did that work out well for you? And were there other things that you maybe did in the early days that people who are wanting to get into being a studio engineer or, or in the early part of it that maybe they would like to know about? It did like first, first part of the question here, like it did, it did work out for me very well. I had recorded as an artist, I, like very young with Jamie King, who is, you know, at this point world famous for, for his work. He lives up in Winston Salem, North Carolina. You know, I had done several projects with him and really admired his workflow and tones and, uh, I just kind of reached out to him and I was like, Hey man, is there any you know, opportunity for me to, to come sit in with you and just kind of watch you do your thing. And then maybe just get some, some general perspectives, approaches, you know, some, some, some tips. And he was really open to it. And uh, I spent some time, you know, watching him do his thing. And it was very beneficial. Uh, picked up a lot from one of my friends out in Burbank. His name's uh, James Salter. Uh, he was very, uh, gracious and, you know, taught me a lot of things. And he was in Atlanta at the time, whenever I met him doing a record and he saw that I was interested in, you know, how, how things were, were being done in the studio. And so he, uh, he kind of, you know, took me under his wing and, and coached me through, he never, you know, he never gave me the entire picture, 
but he always steered me in a direction that I needed to go. But he made, you know, he made me do the work and use my own ears and my own judgment. He never just, you know, like always cut kick drum here, always boost that, you know, like it was never a formulaic thing. It was more of a thought process thing. And so that was another crucial kind of component. And lastly, I got in with a producer uh, engineer. His name is Jordan Valeriot. Very early on when he started his now educational school for engineers and mixers. And so I learned a lot from him. He was very gracious as well. And now I have the opportunity to, you know, be a part of his community. And, you know, he's, he's just a, a fantastic mix engineer and he's more in like the heavier rock genre. So that, that is a, a lot more specific vibe wise and just a lot, a lot of good, good nuggets that I picked up from Jordan as well. You guys have a, like a heavy undercurrent. So I would imagine that working with that, with a person who does that at some point had some, some good influence for you. But yeah, I definitely, yeah. I mean, you, you definitely have a pop kind of punk feel and that whole emo thing, but there's a super heaviness underneath it all that may, I guess makes it cool. But I, maybe that's some of his influence. Eh? Yeah, absolutely, man. And, you know, I think that that's kind of a culmination of the, the people that I've worked with on the recording side. And then also just my, my experiences with with playing with different heavy bands i mean i i always want or always look for energy and typically i find that heavy music you know it doesn't have to be like super low or super gained out but the impact that i'm looking for typically comes out of like heavy hard rock guitars and mm -hmm. i think that's where my ear has always been kind of like a you know gravitated towards or been super attracted to uh, even, even as a very young kid, I was like, oh man, you know, like guitar, like rock, like heavy rock guitar. That's what I want to do. You know, that will always be a part of what I do as a songwriter, creator, producer. And it just, it kind of has just permeated my life. <laughs> so anything I do, it's probably going to be a little more aggressive than if someone else were to do it, then, you know, I guess it is appropriate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that undercurrent is always there, man. That's a good, uh, good catch. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Like I was saying earlier, the quality is really nice, but it has a, a cool, heavy undertone. I was listen. I don't know if you ever listened to, uh, like interviews or read interviews by other engineers, but I've listened or or artists who talk about the experience of being in the studio. But I list I've listened to a couple super interesting ones. I uh, one of them just today from a, a podcast that I really don't typically care that much for, but I saw the name and it was uh, with Glenn Johns, and it oh, was wow. uh, kind of talked about. Um, and the podcast was Rolling Stone, but um, they were talking mostly about his involvement in the Let It Be project and then, you know, how the original movie came out and then his his involvement as a, you know, a, a person in the film of um, Get Back, the, the sort of reworked thing. And uh, But he talks about some of his other work. And then the other one I heard that was great, which is kind of funny because it's with one legendary producer interviewing another guy, but oh my gosh, his name is eluding me for a second. But anyway, the interview was with Trent Reznor. And uh, the interviewers, the guy with the giant beard that's worked with the Chili Peppers, and he's real Ruben. like chill. Thank you, Rick Rubin. He has a new podcast, and he, he was talking with Trent Reznor, and I just heard this one like last week, and it was super fascinating to hear Trent Reznor talk about his early um, records and how the process, you know, like almost didn't work at certain points. Super fascinating stuff, though. I really get into yeah, it. Yeah, Trent Reznor is an amazing uh, songwriter, producer, performer. Uh, yeah. he, he and Rick Rubin both, man, they are all in that vibe camp. And, you know, that's where I want to place myself. Like, I mean, I'm technical. I'm not, not anywhere near as vibey as like Rick Rubin, you know, cause Rick Rubin will just lay on the couch while his engineers <laughs> do everything. <laughs> yeah. His job is to listen for when the music moves him and he knows how he knows how to direct the artists to get it there, you know, and, and when he when he hears it and knows it's right that's that's it you know and that's that's why he you know is where he is is because he's just he knows how to get that vibe he knows when the vibe is right he knows when the take is right and he knows how to communicate with the performer producer engineer as well to uh to elicit that you know yeah. I, I try to model my thinking off of people in that in that mind frame yeah Super interesting guy, obviously done some great work. You guys seem like you work 
or have been maybe always the band seems like you guys work really hard on social media which is uh seems like an unfortunate must <laughs> these uh, days yeah. kind of a mixed blessing but um how, how's that going is it something that's been more recent that you've ramped it up a lot because of the the songs coming out and how are you feeling about it in the future yeah man it's uh it is a necessary evil in my eyes i mean i uh i'm i'm 40 so i know what life is like before a smartphone and, and social media and uh while it is very addictive uh, i just find it to be a, a time suck and a a way for anxiety to creep into your mind but uh, it, it is something that we have to do as a band, which, you know, once again, I don't mind doing and I don't mind engaging uh, with our fans. But, you know, I think right now we're just trying to basically play the numbers game and, and grow our platforms in a, an organic way. Because, you know, we, we you know, our talks with, you know, different labels at this point in time, but it's they are like, we love the music. But, you know, it's it's one of the things where they're like, we need to see some some results, you know, and I understand that because as a potential investor, it makes perfect sense to me. Yeah, it's kind of and crazy. That's, that's kind of the game you have to play these days. But, you know, that being said, it also is an incredible vehicle to promote yourself and get yourself out there and really grow your brand. And uh, I, I definitely don't think it's all bad, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What tricks do you have, or maybe you and your bandmates have, for being okay with it? And and because uh, I know, like you said, there's all this the the hard aspects of it, but obviously the good things about it and the must must do things about it. But what do you guys? What makes it okay for you guys when you're on social? Uh, what's the best part of it? I really enjoy the live streams, like the Instagram live streams, because you know we'll set up you know, video down in the studio and, you know, we'll like pop open a single or a song and break down some stems and just engaging and interacting, you know, as opposed to the just double click, like, uh, you know, two word comment, move on. It's, it's a little more interactive and engaging. And that's, that's probably my favorite part of it. And then, you know, having someone that you admire in turn, admire your work on social media is, is a big payoff too. That's, that's a really fun thing. Like we had, uh, one of my favorite producers ever, Howard Benson, he he liked one of our posts about our single and I was just like, well, that makes my year. <laughs> <laughs> ton of respect for uh, for Howard Benson. He made uh, one of my favorite records of all time. So I'm just like, yes. Which record was that? Uh, it's a record by this band called Blindside. It's called Silence. Okay. And uh, if you haven't listened to it yet, highly recommend checking it out it's some of the best some of my favorite tones captured for you know that style of rock which is you know heavier some screaming elements but still big courses it 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 strikes the emotional chord and benson and his team are just stellar at, at getting the killer production or the killer capture uh, mm -hmm. on the engineering side but also combining all of that to just sound like this force that moves you, you know? And I think that that's kind of one, once again, what that's kind of what I modeled my approach. Sounds like a good approach to, to go after. Yeah, man. I read in your, uh, in your bio, I guess that your brother was in the band at one time and they passed in 2020. What happened to him? Uh, my brother, yes, he uh, he was a bass player, and I had played in bands previously with him throughout our life. Uh, killer bass player. He was three years younger than me. He was also a badass trumpet player, but uh, he passed away. He ended up uh, graduating from veterinary school and then uh, uh, unfortunately took his own life in 2020. I'm sorry. Well, I'm sorry that he passed at all, and that's seemed, that would make it harder, I would imagine. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's still... It's it's a day to day struggle, but you know we think about the good things and the good times, and uh, I just wish he was a part of this, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's um, nice that you guys are remembering him the way that you are. Uh, I saw that you're dedicating some of the work, recent work that you're doing to him, and saw a nice picture of him. I guess uh, in the studio with you or something. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, man. I I do. I keep a picture of him on the console. So. <laughs> do you have any other siblings? I do not. Just me. <laughs> your, is your does your family live your parents or anything? Are they around? Do they? 
they live yeah there? my parents are local they live about uh like 25 minutes outside of wilmington and uh i i hang out with them all the time man i lo- love my folks they're super gracious super good humans and uh they have certainly been over backwards to uh sometimes begrudgingly support me on this musical journey <laughs> <laughs> uh, so nice. i have a, a hold them in high regard love them to death for sure did you say that you grew up or that you're a native of wilmington I actually was born in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and uh, my parents had me when they were in college, and my dad graduated from pharmacy school shortly after I was born, and then he bought a pharmacy in the Wilmington area, so I okay. uh, ended up grow- growing up around here. That's cool. Probably a decent place to grow up by. Oh, dude, it's awesome. We are, you know, <laughs> like about an eight-hour drive from New York. We got a beach here, like six hours to the mountains. To be in Florida in eight hours, Atlanta's like six hours away. Like it's it's a pretty uh it's a pretty great spot to live. The only issue is uh, basically the time that we're going through right now, which is absurdly hot weather. I was about <laughs> to ask high, how it was there. Whew, high humidity. Although today it's not that bad, man. I think our high is like eighty four. The humidity is like tolerable. But you know when it's one hundred outside and the humidity is ninety percent, it's just it's unescapable, man. Inescapable, unescapable. However, that is it's misery. <laughs> <laughs> get away <laughs> i heard you mention i think i heard you say it or i saw it on one of your reels maybe it's both actually you mentioned a day gig so it sounds like you do some work outside of music and with one of your bandmates is that right and and if so can you tell tell me a little bit about it yeah actually uh logan and i we work for the same company and it's a music company called mojo tone and uh we are a manufacturing facility uh, we we do some OEM manufacturing for other companies, but we have our own line of guitar cabinets, guitar pickups, amps. Uh, we, we are a small parts supplier, and we've really seen some exponential growth over the past two years especially. Uh, but I do um, all the audio for the company. I do some marketing tasks. I do uh, some third-party sales with managing like the Amazon Reverb store. It's all music all the time for me, man. I get to go and be in the industry that I've always dreamed of being in. How cool. And then come home from working in music all day and jump right back into music. You know, whether I'm rehearsing guitar with, you know, several bands that I jam with or in the studio track in a band, it's like, <laughs> it's and it's by design, man. I uh, I love every minute of it. Very cool. I think I had a guest on the podcast a long time ago who is or was with Reverb. I don't know if he still is. Uh, Joe George. Do you know him? Of him? I do not know Joe. Um, do, you, do you know of him? I do not, man. He's the only reason I, I bring him up. He's, again, it's been, a, I think I spoke to him back in 2018. He, like, I don't know his whole job description, but he did a ton of their YouTube reviews, and he's like a really... A uh, great musician. I don't know if he does like a lot of. I guess he does do some recording, but I don't know if he um, is as deep into recording as you are. But definitely a great musician. Um, oddly enough, when I met him, he had. I didn't even know it until the day I was interviewing. He had gone on tour with a friend of mine, this guy named Rex Bra- Rex Brown, who played in Pantera many years ago. I was about to actually, say that's the Pantera I, bass player. <laughs> yeah, I, actually, yeah, actually, he he's playing with them again, I guess, sort of, with the singer and a couple other f- old friends of the band, but as a pan- like a Pantera reunion. But anyway, it was so funny uh, for Joe to tell me he he did a small stint with him to support his first solo album. But uh, yeah, I was just Sweet. curious. if You should look him up. I don't know if he's still doing all their... He'll do like um, the series that I saw. People would ask him how so-and-so made such and such sound on an album. So he would take mm-hmm. his best stab at it and play you know, usually a guitar thing, and he would play it on on YouTube. Pretty cool. Very sweet, man. Yeah, you can uh, you can really generate some uh, some sick passive income on YouTube if you uh, if you're doing the right thing and have the right out right audience. You know, mm-hmm. working hard I mean, at dude, it. <laughs> YouTube is is the greatest resource ever, personally, man. Because you know, like I, I own a home, and if something breaks, it's like I don't know how to fix you know this whatever. But yeah, man, just type it into YouTube and you can have it done in 15 minutes. <laughs> I know I was uh, yakking on a podcast intro about a bunch of things going wrong in the uh, house all at once. And uh, it was uh, part of the thread was thank God bless YouTube for helping me like resolve some of them, you know, myself. Oh, yeah, dude. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but anyway, well, hey, it's wonderful to finally meet you i believe you had rescheduled to make this happen for which i'm really appreciative it was kind of last minute on my part to do that to you but i appreciate it 
No, man, it's all good. I uh, I have thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. Well, thank you. Um, best of luck to you and your bandmates. It was kind of fun to talk to one of the guitarists. Usually it's like the lead vocalist who comes on. Do you sing also, by the way? I do. Um, you know, that's something else that, that we all, you know, really dig about all the pretty things is, you know, we, we are uh, what I like to call a, a pop band that's dressed up with heavy guitar. Um, but we also really focus on having super tight harmonies um, because that's, you know, that's what I grew up with, you know, with bands like the Beatles, uh, you know, the harmonies were always fascinating to me and they always pulled me into the music a little more. And I was like, guys, if we're, we're going to do it, we've got to have, you know, sick choruses with at least three parts going on at all times. <laughs> <laughs> I meant to ask you, by the way, it just remembered, uh, what's the story behind the name and the way that you guys present it? Oh, interesting. So that is one of my least favorite parts about being a musician is naming a band. <laughs> um, yeah, I would rather edit drums for six hours than try to name a band. Uh, we started out, you know, you get this list together and it's long and obnoxious. Uh, and we, you know, we had this you know crazy list and we settled on all the pretty things. It actually stemmed from a Jimmy Eat World lyric, which we are all huge fans of. When, when you hear the record, there's a lot of uh, a lot of Jimmy Eat World in there for me personally. I love their sound and I have followed that band religiously for, uh, geez, I guess they've been a band for about two decades now. But uh, I love them to death, and it it was kind of serendipitous that that lyric just fit, and uh, we decided to, you know, do all lowercase one word just because it was a really long name. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, again, great talking with you. I gathered that I visited your website. It looks like all your socials are there, and from there, and Inst I see you guys are big on Instagram, and from there, I know you guys have a link tree there, but it's all the pretty things official dot com, which will take you, got it. you to all your all your cool social accounts for people to find out more about you. And yeah, we're thanks a lot for, for spending time with me. It's a great conversation. Sure. And uh, I guess I'll speak to the listener. Uh, thank you guys for, for listening and uh, feel free to hit us up at any time. If you just want to talk about production or about songs, I mean, it's all about community and engaging and, and, you know, that's, I always felt uh, really uh, I, I, would, I would say special whenever someone I idolized or looked up to uh, in, in, in music communicated with me and shared with me. So I would, I'd be more than happy to chat about anything. So hit us up. Right on, man. I love that. Good luck. Awesome, man. It's been a fantastic conversation. Thanks so much, man. All right. Cheers. This episode was powered by Podcast Startup. If you feel you need a little help with that podcast you're contemplating, Podcast Startup may be just the thing for you. Podcast Startup is a program designed for new podcasters. Did you know that most podcasts don't make it past their first few episodes? That's right. They start, they stall, and then they die. Sustaining a podcast ain't easy. It's commitment. A lack of planning and misaligned expectations are a recipe for fast burnout and fade out for podcasters. This is exactly the kind of thing that Podcast Startup was designed to help you with. If you're intrigued, if you want to start a podcast the right way, go to unstarvingmusician.com forward slash podcast startup to learn more and to receive free podcast startup tips from yours truly. Thank you for listening. You can leave us feedback, questions, comments, complaints at unstarvingmusician.com forward slash feedback. If you enjoyed this podcast, please follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. If you love this podcast, please visit unstarvingmusician.com forward slash crowd sponsor to learn about the many ways of showing your love and support. Your support does indeed equal love. The series music you heard in this episode is New Gods Part 2 by Yours Truly. Find links for all the places to hear the full version with vocals by Yours Truly at robonzo.com. If you do not yet have a website for your music, check out Bandzoogle. It was created to help musicians and bands build their website and manage direct to fan marketing and sales. Bandzoogle has amazing design options, a commission-free store to sell music, merch, tickets, and more plus tools that can capture detailed fan data for you. Try it at banzoogle.com. Use the promo code Robonzo, that's R-O-B-O-N-Z-O, -O -O, to get 15% off your first year. Find links for all the people and things talked about in this episode at unstarvingmusician.com. Peace, love, and a whole lot of gratitude.